Conservative. Constitutional. It's the Andrew Cooper Writer Show, keeping you informed on what's going on right here in Kentucky. Today on the Andrew Cooper Writer Show, Representative Ken Fleming files House Bill 711 with co sponsor Killian and Timoney and Representative Gooch, a bill that if passed, would guarantee that Kentucky quickly becomes the state with the highest rate of reported rapes while simultaneously making it clear that uh, none of those sponsors are truly pro-life at all. We'll be digging into that. Also, Senator Danny Carroll decides to continue to push a giant government welfare program that would particularly help line his own pocket as he's involved in the child care, but also is a whole lot of spending that doesn't solve any problems at all. And as filing deadline for bills is today in the Senate, it was Monday in the House. We'll go over exactly what to expect moving forward. And we'll have all that and more today on the Andrew Cooperetter Show. Of course, I'm your host, Andrew Cooperetter. So House Bill 711, sponsored by this guy, Ken Fleming, as well as co-sponsor Killian Timoney and Representative Gooch, is a bill that seeks to add exemptions for rape and incest into our current abortion law. Right now in Kentucky, you can only uh, get an abortion in case of life of the mother. So they want to add in this provision. And before before I go into how, if you're pro-life, you don't support this bill and that argument behind the pro-life argument before I do that, I, I, I don't want to, I don't want to do that because if you're pro-life, you immediately know this is a bad bill, but I want to talk to those who currently believe that these types of exemptions are good, that we need them, that we have to have them and speak about why you should still not support this bill, why this bill will turn Kentucky into the rape capital in the country, because we really have to deal with a few key points of the bill. So it seeks to say, well, if you've uh, been a victim of rape or incest and uh, you discover you're pregnant, you can get an abortion as long as you get that abortion within six weeks after your last missed menstrual cycle. So basically a a, a 10 to 12 week-ish period where you can get an abortion if you're pregnant. Now, most people look at that and say, well, that's relatively uh, simple. That's a pretty good parameter, but becomes the problem with this bill, where this bill goes off the rails, is it doesn't actually require the woman to accuse anybody of having raped her. It doesn't require there to be a legal filing. It doesn't require her to go to the police and have reported the rape. It doesn't require anything like that at all. Instead, what this bill does is says that a licensed physician can perform an abortion if the reasonable medical judgment of the physician is that the pregnancy is the result of a rape as defined under Kentucky law, and that that abortion is performed no later than six weeks after the first day of the woman's last menstrual period. Now, why is it? That a physician is at a a point to make a medical judgment on if somebody was raped a month ago, a month and a half ago, two months ago. Why is that their medical position to go after? What what would point them to know? All there's no a, a doctor is no more a medical expert on if this woman was actually raped ten weeks ago than I am. Than I am right here as I sit you would be a more of an expert or the same amount of expertise as a doctor would have under that. So it just really requires an abortion doctor and considering the fact that these abortion doctors are already willing to murder children, let's keep that in mind, they're more than likely very willing to accept what other story that the woman gives them. Keep in mind, there's doctors out there that would be willing to perform abortions up until the moment of birth. Up until the moment of birth, do you think those same doctors wouldn't be more than willing to attest that, well, she said she was raped. Okay, let's go ahead and move forward with it. It doesn't require there to be charges filed. It just requires that the woman had a good story when she came in to see them. That's it. And is there any punishments in the bill for if a female lied, if it was discovered later on that in fact she wasn't raped? 
Is there anything along those lines at all? Absolutely not. Because if you're really pro-life and if you call yourself pro-life, but for some reason you support this, like I said, we'll discuss that in a bit. Wouldn't you want a provision that says if a woman comes in and claims rape to get an abortion and then it's discovered she wasn't really raped, should she be charged with murder? Should the doctor be charged with murder? Within their medical judgment, she was raped? Should their license be removed? Well, your medical judgment's bad. You didn't know she wasn't raped. No, no, the, it doesn't require any of those things. So what that means is Kentucky will quickly become the accused rape capital of the world. If this bill passes, that's what would happen. There'd be more and more women claiming to have been raped simply because they want to kill their unborn child. That will be what's behind it. And you ask yourself, what's driving this? Ken Fleming says, well, you know, I imagine my daughters and everything else. And I understand that Ken having daughters, you know, him looking at that, he says, well, I don't know if I'd want them carrying a baby if they were raped. And I understand that feeling. I do. And we'll discuss more about that. But wouldn't you, Ken, want, if your daughters were raped, for their rapist to be held accountable for it? Wouldn't you want their rapist to have to have charges filed against them? If you're going to kill your grandchild in the womb and allow your daughter to do that, wouldn't you want somebody going to jail for it? Wouldn't you? Why wasn't that required in the bill? It was almost like you're specifically trying to open up a loophole as best you can. And of course, they're doing this mainly trying to take this issue off the table. They're saying, look, we want to appear reasonable on this. They're not pro-life. We'll go into that. If you, if you believe in this, you're not pro-life. You don't believe an unborn child is the same as a born child. That means you're not pro-life. But what is pushing behind this but to take a political argument off the table? But yet the argument in and of itself, this bill isn't even good enough for them. They hate the bill. The people who love abortion hate the bill. So even from a political standpoint, if you're saying, I think this is politically the best move to make, all you've managed to do is upset everybody. It's not even a good political move to make. Because once again, even if you're for these exemptions, surely you would be for somebody being held legally accountable for the rape then, right? Right? I mean, that is the biggest issue. If we had increased punishments for rape and incest when convicted, increased punishments for those things, coupled with you have to file. If you, if you really believe, you know, you, you want to deal with this, you have to file a report if somebody does rape you. A legal report. How many of these abortions do you think would really be done? Next to zero. It'd be next to zero because there really isn't that many. I mean, less than 1% of all abortions are done in case of life of the mother, case of rape or incest. And so with that in mind, why wouldn't you throw this in here? Why wouldn't you require that? Because you don't actually care. This is a political thing you're trying to do. But politically, it's not even a good decision to make. But what if you're pro-life and you say, Andrew, I'm pro-life. I believe in exemptions. I believe uh, in abortions in case of rape or incest. Why are you saying I'm not pro-life if I do? I'll be going over that after this short break. We've got to come up on a break here. You're listening to The Andrew Kubretter Show, your source for Kentucky politics. If you want to reach out to the show, feel free to email info at theandrewshow.com. Once again, that's info at theandrewshow.com. We'll be covering more on this House Bill 711, all the issues with it uh, after this short break. And you're back with the Andrew Cooperwriter Show, your source for Kentucky politics. For the break, we're talking about House Bill 711 bill filed by Ken Fleming, co-sponsored by Killian Timoney and Representative Gooch, that would allow uh, exemptions that would allow you to get an abortion as long as you're at least within six to six-ish weeks since your last uh, menstrual cycle. So it'd be about 10-ish, 12-ish weeks, eight to 12 weeks. 
to allow an abortion eight to twelve week old uh, child in the womb to get you to have an abortion if the doctor believes that there has been a case of rape. Not there's been rape charges filed, not evidence, not investigated, but if the doctor believes that 10 weeks ago a rape happened, you can get an abortion in Kentucky. That's what was filed, which, as I stated in the last segment, will inevitably lead to a whole lot of accusations of rape in Kentucky, but not a whole lot of charges filed, which, you know, I guess if you want to make Kentucky look like the rape capital of the world, you're succeeding here. But what if you're pro-life? I mean, these people filing this bill will claim to be pro-life. I mean, one of the co-sponsors, Killian Timoney, claims to be a good Catholic. Uh, Catholicism and Catholics are known for having very strong pro-life stances, are known for valuing life in the womb exactly the same as a born child. Why should you be against this bill? Why should you be against rape and incest exemptions in the first place? That's a difficult conversation, but we're going to have it. And I know it's hard for politicians to have it. So for those of you who agree with me, or maybe I sway you over to my side here in a second, it's up to us to continue to have these discussions and to push these viewpoints out there. Because if we don't, we won't shift the culture. We can't expect our politicians to try to be making these arguments while they're running for office. Their motivations aren't the same as ours. Their motivations are to get in office, right, wrong, or indifferent. That's what their motivations are. So let's have this discussion and let's make sure we continue to push these viewpoints out there. So if you're pro-life, what you're saying is you believe life begins at conception. You're saying that a child in the womb has exactly the same value as a child that's born. Now, our current laws even have, all across this nation, even in the most liberal areas, still have that viewpoint for if you murder a pregnant woman, you are charged with a double murder, murdering the child in the womb. Even in some of the most liberal states, that is the case. So even within law, in many places, we say that an unborn child has the same value as a born child. But let's say you're pro-life and you say, I believe life begins at conception. I believe that uh, you know an unborn child has the same value as a born child but I also believe in exemptions. You can't. You can't say those things together, and here's why. Let's take a one-year-old child. Let's take a six-month-old. Let's take a 10-day. Let's take a one-day-old child, a just-born child, two minutes after being born, and you're looking at two children, and one born normal, and the other one you find out after they've been born has been the product of a rape or incest. Would you kill it? Would you kill that born child that was a product of a rape or incest? As unfortunate as the situation may be, would you kill that child? Now, unless you're a psychopath who should be locked up for the rest of your life, I would hope you would have answered with, no, you shouldn't kill a born child just because of how it was conceived. So the minute, though, you say you can kill an unborn child, no matter where, because of how it was conceived, you've already acquiesced to the idea that a born child has a higher value than an unborn child. And now, all you're doing when you're talking with the left and you're passing these types of abortion legislation laws is negotiating over how much value and where that is. Your entire belief and premise that life begins at conception, that an unborn child has the same value as a born child, goes out the window the minute you say you would kill an unborn child in a situation where you wouldn't kill a born child. And of course, we do expect those seeking abortions to have those viewpoints that they would kill unborn childs. I mean, it's very likely that, you know, uh, these women going in willing, and for those of you who think they wouldn't be willing to falsely claim rape, keep in mind they're trying to kill a child here. I mean, they, they probably think it's more wrong to kill a cat or a dog than an eight-month-old child if they're going in to get a, or an eight-month-in-the-womb child if they're going in to get an abortion because they're monsters. They're horrible people. They don't view human life as exactly the same. So in that same vein, they're more than willing to lie. And the doctors performing these abortions, like I said, there's doctors out there that would perform abortions the minute before the kid's born. You think that they won't be willing to lie in these situations or fudge the truth a little bit if they think they can get away with it. Because remember, in this bill, there's no prescriptions 
for what happens if it's proven that an abortion has taken place without there having been a rape. Nothing at all. No charges of murder. Nothing. Because, of course, you can't put it in there. It doesn't make logical sense. You can't say that, well, you killed a child, but it was the product of rape, but now we find out it wasn't the product of rape, so now you get charged with murder. You can't say that. Because now what you're saying is that a child has different value (laughs) based upon how it was conceived, which makes no sense, no logical sense, unless, of course, once again, you're a psychopath. So you can't be pro-life and claim life begins at conception and claim that an unborn child has the same value as a born child if you hold this viewpoint that these types of exemptions exist. But what should we do then as pro-life people? What should we be pushing for to deal with this situation? Well, I've talked about it on my show before, but this is my solution. And hopefully those of you listening can get on board. Here's my solution. No matter who you are, No matter if a child results from it or not, if you are convicted, a man convicted of rape, you should have to pay into a system for 18 years, a monthly payment like it's child support. Even if you raped and it didn't result in a pregnancy, if you committed rape and it didn't result in a pregnancy, you should still have to pay. Regardless of your jail time, you should still have to pay into this system and pay for 18 years into the, it doesn't matter if, if it starts prison arrears, whatever you have to pay into this for 18 years, like it's child support. And then if you do commit this and it results in a pregnancy, you also obviously have to pay into this system. And then that big old pot of money will be spent specifically to provide everything that this mother and child that has been the, the child that's been the product of rape needs in order to, to have a very successful, amazing life. Free housing, free care, free college for the kid, free college for the mom, right? Anything they need, we will cover because they've been the victim of a horrible crime and those that are committing those crimes will be the ones that pay for it. I'm not talking about tax dollars paying for it. I'm talking about the pieces of trash out there raping doing it. And the minute you put that in place, how how many people do you think will take that risk? I mean, that you want to talk about increasing the charges. Imagine if, you, if there was a crime out there where you knew for the next 18 years you would be paying three, 400 bucks a month, 500 bucks a month, whatever it is, you'd be on the hook to pay that for 18 years a month. You wouldn't be committing those crimes. Or at least you'd hope they wouldn't be committing those crimes. They definitely think twice about it, right? Versus just going in for jail time. I mean, that's how we can actually address this and put in place policies to take care of these mothers who have been the victims of terrible circumstances without having to kill an innocent child in the process. But instead of standing by those principles, those pro-life principles and the principles that if somebody commits a crime, they should be held accountable for it. Instead, we have this bill like House Bill 711 that says, oh, Not only if a crime has been committed, can we just murder somebody, but also nobody has to be held into account for it. Nobody has to be taken to prison for it. Nobody has to be tried for it. Nobody has to deal with that. And then what if, if this comes about, we then have false accusations of rapes? Because that would be the other aspect. I mean, if it's completely proven, that you have claimed a false accusation of rape in order to get an abortion. And that has led to a man being charged and go through courts, even possibly put in prison, but there's been evidence you are falsely claiming this. Those, there should be charges in that situation too as well. Not just civil charges like saw in that baseball suit, but there should be criminal charges for that as well. I want people who commit crimes to be held accountable, but I don't want kids killed in the process. That's not what this bill accomplishes. It doesn't really accomplish anything other than the slaughter of children. And these people putting it up there, these people who are supporting it, Representative Ken Fleming, Representative Timney, Representative Gooch, they're not pro-life. They'll go back to their constituents. They'll say, look at me, I'm pro-life. These pieces of trash have probably even, and I'm calling them pieces of trash because they're advocating for the murder of children. I'm not trying to be over the top per se, 
But if you know these representatives, you've ever thought about voting for these representatives, you ever thought about donating to these representatives, you should never do so. These people want to okay the slaughter of children without holding accountable even the rapists in the situation. What kind of person does that? What kind of person sits there and says, oh, I've been raped? Well, I guess you can murder that kid, but who raped you? Oh, you don't want charges pressed? Okay. Still, go ahead and murder the kid. That is not a good person, and it's not the kind of person we should be seeking to have in public office if you're conservative, if you're pro-life like I am, if you believe life begins at conception, if you believe in valuing life as a whole. Instead, we should be putting forward legislation to toughen up the punishments for rape, to provide more resources to women who have children because of victims of rape. Because I tell you this much, there's not that many. And so if everybody who commits a rape has to pay into the system for 18 years, as I described, there'd be more than enough money to provide all the services those few who have been victims of rape that have had children need help with. Coming up after this, we'll be digging into Danny Carroll's child care bill. Speaking of children, we'll be talking about that after this break. We'll see you back here in a few, few short minutes. And you are back with the Andrew Cooperwriter Show, your source for Kentucky politics. So Danny Carroll has put forward this Horizons Act. It's $300 million in order to help the stopgap, I guess, as they're calling it, within our child care industry. So supposedly, <laughs> and I'm saying supposedly, right? But anyway, what they're saying is, is that our child care system was headed for disaster pre-COVID. Then COVID hit and we got all these federal dollars and somehow all this extra funding has really saved our childcare system. And, and they have gotten a lot of money, a lot more money than they got pre, you know, 2020, right? And that money though is all ending in September. And it is estimated that they need $300 million in order to continue offering child care at the same rates and levels and costs to families. They need $300 million from the state government. And so I wanted to dig into how much money are they getting now? Is this needed? What's this going to? What's going on? And so I dug into some numbers, okay? So uh, now according to a 2019 fact sheet, on child care that was from the Center for Economic Development, uh, CD.org, that's Charlie Echo Delta.org. Um, according to this fact sheet from 2019, there was 170,152 enrolled children in child care in Kentucky under the age of 15. Under the age of five, that number drops to about 74. Thousand. Now, currently, the federal government is giving Kentucky about $95 million a year, and that's what they used to give them, they continue to give them, in something called the Child Care and Development Block Grant, which is to help fund the uh, Child Care Assistance Program, or CCAP, Child Care Assistance Program. And in our current budget that our legislature has put together, we're giving them about another $40 million a year in state funds. So if Horizon passes, then that would add that $300 million being spent to, to child care, over $300 million being spent there, to now the total would be $435 million a year that our state is spending on child care. Now, Senator Carroll trying to pass this $300 million bill, on top of the $40 million the state has already allocated, on top of the $95 million, bringing our total $435 million, right? Well, when we look at the same uh, Center for Economic Development CED fact sheet, in 2019, they state that the Kentucky uh, child care revenues before costs and expenses, so this is gross revenues, was $477 million. Now, we're giving, though, $435 million. And keep in mind, they said this is just to maintain what we're currently doing, our current costs. This isn't to lower costs, right? So... This means, though, with 170,000 kids under age 15, 74,890 under five in paid care, 
That means the average Kentucky family at this $435 million in funding, but yet, you know, child care as a whole is only getting $477 million a year in revenues, gross revenues. That means that the average Kentucky family should only be paying $246 a year a kid for child care. Yet, Senator Carroll claims this is only to maintain the current cost levels for families. Well, currently, though, Kentucky families, this is according to the Census Bureau, are spending $7,640 per child in care. So that's a difference of $7,394 a child per year. Where is all that extra money going? Where's it going? Where, where's it being lost at? So I, I wanted an answer to this. Well, fortunately for us, Danny Carroll was on KET recently to explain his Horizons Act, and he was asked uh, about the bill. Let's hear if he can describe how this $300 million, where's it going? Because, you know, parents should only be paying $246 a year, but they're paying much more than that. Let's hear what, uh, what he has to say here. And the bill tries to address... Uh, all aspects of this and trying to grow providers in different areas. And we even have a fund in the grant or in the uh, bill, a grant for innovations. And this, these are for new ideas in delivery. We've set aside some funding for that. We set aside funding for more traditional centers, the, uh, the family, early childhood education homes, grant funding for them. And then also uh, we set up a program that's much like seat dollars for K through 12. It's called the uh, foundation. <laughs> And it's based on a, a per child allotment, uh, looking at the, uh, uh, the enrollment throughout the state and then whatever money we end up in that pot, we will divide that into uh, semi-annual installments. And hopefully that will help a lot of these centers keep their doors open and then foster growth of new centers. And also an associate's degree could be available through KCTCS. Tell it, us about this interdisciplinary degree. It is. Uh, it's a, it's a degree. associate's degree in early childhood education entrepreneurship. And uh, this particular degree will be part of the Work Ready Scholarship. Uh, I was very excited when I contacted KCTCS, Dr. Quarles, his staff, they were on board from the minute. I spoke to them on the phone, and this is something that uh, we think will grow entrepreneurs and give students the skills to open up their own center, operate. It, it, it's, it goes from A to Z in opening a center, operating it, teaching. All of those things are part of this degree, and we're pretty excited about that. Yeah. Oh, I get it. Okay, so you see it's not actually going to paying child care expenses. No, 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 no. Instead, it's going to the very things that have burdened the child care industry in the first place with inflated costs, regulations and growing government, creating government education systems, handing out. And then they say investments in research, you know, giving out grants for research for delivery methods. Oh, OK, so you're going to be spending the money on something that one, this is a private industry. So if there's you know, advancements in the industry, you'd hope that there's enough business incentive to, you know, make those advancements, private investment. But no, 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 the government's going to not let the market decide. No, 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 no. Because if the market had decided, maybe childcare wouldn't be in the position it is in the first place. No, instead, it's going to be the government deciding what gets the funding, what gets the advancements, who's receiving that money. Who's receiving, uh, who, whose research and investments make the most sense? And then on top of that, talk about creating big government, take a look at, uh, remember what he just said about the degree he is pushing at KCTCS, a, a degree for running a child care center. I'm telling you, you don't need this. This is government regulations, big government coming in saying, you, we need a program for this. You, we don't need this. You don't get business skills. You don't learn how to run a daycare center by sitting in a classroom. You learn those things by working in them, by actually doing the job. You know, work as a child care provider and, and at the front level, taking care of kids, move up to a manager, move up to a, a center director, start your own business. That way, the, the taxpayers don't have to pay for you to get this degree that is probably not going to teach you anything. And I'm not just saying that because the government's useless at teaching anything. No, I'm saying that from my own experience. For those of you who are unaware, a little bit of personal story here. I'm a private business owner. I own several companies. I employ dozens of people. I have like 30, 40 people on my staff. I only graduated high school. And then 
I got to work and I learned my business skills. I learned money management skills. I learned work ethic. I learned how to run a payroll because that was part of my job. I had a, a, one of my positions I had as a market manager at one point for a company. I was completely in charge of my own budget and allocating resources. Those things taught me how to run a business. On the other hand, my wife went to college and got a bachelor's degree from Spalding in business and marketing. And she'll be the first to tell you, I know way more about business marketing and how to run a successful company than she does. It's nothing against her. It's because I have more experience because I didn't learn it from a classroom. Remember those who can't do teach. So rather than learning from people who can't do, I ended up learning from people who can in the real world and saw what real success would look like, meaning we beat the odds. Most small businesses fail within the first five years. We didn't. We beat the odds. We created a successful company. We work for ourselves because I had the real life experience to do it. Not a degree. I didn't sit in a classroom. But instead of that, what we're saying is let's steal money from the taxpayer from your pocket and fund some associate's degree that will probably not really teach them anything about the real world. But will this actually be enough money? Will 300 million be enough to fix our child care problem? No, 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 no. Danny, he had more opinion on this too as well. We will be listening to that after this short break. You're listening to the Andrew Cooper Show, your source for Kentucky politics. And you are back with the Andrew Kubrater Show, your source for Kentucky politics. Before the break, we've been discussing Danny Carroll's Horizons Act bill to give $300 million into early childhood education. And I was going through some of the numbers in the last segment, and I brought up the fact that there is a lot of money that is unexplained. Because with government funding all totaling $435 million for early childhood Hood education, care, daycare, those kinds of things. But yet the revenues were only $477 million. Where's all this money going? Where's it going to go to? Well, Danny explained it to us. He explained that he's got all these uh, ideas, big government ideas, boondoggles for investments and research and a degree nobody needs and, you know, yada, yada, yada. But the question is, you know, how do you arrive at $300 million? Is that enough? Is this going to be an endless pit of money? Well, let's see what Danny Carroll has to say on that front. To arrive at the $300 million number, which isn't attached to the bill, but you can explain that as well. Uh, swinging for the fence, Renee. This, this issue is so important uh, to our state, to our families, to our kids, to our economy, to the safety of our children, you name it. This impacts that, and, and it's worth every cent of that investment. Uh, and it's a, it's a good number to start with. And we will learn as years go by where we can best invest every dollar that we spend. But it's a start. And that's what we've got to do is make that start. And we've got to stop looking at K through 12. It's got to be birth through 12. And professionalizing the the field of early childhood education. You, as you made your remarks last week, I think in committee, you talked about how this is not babysitting. It's We should not use the lexicons child care or daycare. It's early childhood education. Why is it so important to change the language? It, it's just the way we look at it. And, and you, with those words, it's kind of an afterthought, just something that happens while mom and dad can work and not really thinking about the kids. And we know the kids start learning at birth. We know that 85, 90% of their brain develops in the first five years of their life. What are we missing? Danny, I'll tell you what you're missing. I'll tell you what you're missing, Danny. Hope you're sitting down. I hope you're listening to this. I know a lot of the legislators tune in. I hope they told Danny Carroll, hey, make sure you tune into this. You know what they're missing? They're missing their parents at home and taxing those parents more to pay for your boondoggles, forcing them into the workplace because they can't pay their bills anymore because you need to fund all the different government programs you can for them. That is what they're missing. They need their parents. I get it. You think parents are useless, Danny. You think parents can't teach young children how to read or write. They don't care enough to bother to read to their kids and teach them basic ABCs given the time. These, these parents don't care enough. We get it, Danny. You don't think parents give two cares about their kids. You've, you've sent the message loud and clear. Because clearly, as you just said, we need to be getting these kids 
into early childhood care. In other words, we need to be getting these kids into government run education centers as quickly as possible. Government funded in this case, education centers as quickly as possible. That's how we're going to fix this. Because, you know, now Danny didn't say this, but it's implied kid parents, if they were with them at home, they just, they wouldn't do this. They wouldn't do this. So we got to make the parents go work, you know, because we're going to tax them as much as we can. And then we're going to take their money, turn around and use that to fund programs for them to put their kids in rather than staying home with their kids. You know, maybe if we didn't regulate daycare so much, maybe if we let the child care industry be an industry, uh, free market, maybe if we didn't try to fix all your problems with government money, even though we can't, it would be more affordable for one parent to stay home with the kids. But no, we're not going to do that. Instead, we're going to dump more of their money into this to force them into the workplace because it's going to result in us having to charge more taxes. We're going to have to make this money up somewhere. And so we're going to have to charge more taxes, which will force more people into the workplace because they'll have less money to pay for things. And it's, it's about to the intangibles. You know, we hear, we hear Bashir and them all talking about, well, if we get to them early, they'll learn how to read and write and, and, and do math better, which is dubious at best because I've dug into this on, you know, uh, early childhood education results and so on and so forth. And there's no real good indication that a child being with their parent who takes the steps to teach them this and early childhood education programs that a parent enrolls a kid in because they have to work is going to actually make a difference in outcome. Now, uh, uh, the parent, the, the kid of a child, uh, the, the child of a parent that isn't involved and doesn't do anything and doesn't enroll them are just bad parents, which is something that takes community to fix. Government can't fix that. They're going to turn out the same way regardless. But it's also about these intangibles, more than just reading or writing. It's, it's about, you know, we see kids becoming, well, I guess these aren't intangibles because we can see it in the data. Kids are becoming more depressed, less prepared to be uh, you know, in the real world, child suicide rates skyrocketing. We see, uh, you know, youth crime on a rise, you know, as we've seen a discussion on the crime bills and things dealing with youth crime in Kentucky, a real problem, a real issue. We've seen those things on the rise. And when we track back what's causing it, it has to do with a lack of parental involvement. But instead of encouraging those parents, one parents to stay together, not be single parent households instead of enabling them to be single parent households and, and, and kind of basically setting it up to where you need to take care of your children because that's on you and your responsibility, not governments, not your neighbors. That's on you. Take care of your own. Instead of pushing that idea, we're pushing an idea through regulation, through taxation, through programs offering that you can't be trusted to teach your kid. You can't be trusted to raise your kid. You need to get out there and get to work. We're going to make sure you don't have enough money to make that kind of decision. We're going to make sure. That's what they're missing. And then you heard Danny say, this is a never ending boondoggle. He said he's swinging for the fences at 300 million, but they don't really know. And as time goes on, they'll figure out where to put more money but they don't really know. I mean, he doesn't have a number. It's the same thing as all these education. You ask one question, how much will it take for kids to learn to read and write? K through 12 education. We ask that question. They don't have an answer. And you ask that question to the government, apparently, and Danny Carroll putting forward this bill about zero through whatever, five, six education. He doesn't have an answer either. Why? It's because government can't solve that. They're not good at solving that issue. It takes an involved parent. And dumping money into this endless pit isn't helping us solve it. It is actually doing the opposite because parents need to be involved with their kids. They need to be taxed less. They need to be able to spend more time with their children. And we need to make sure that everybody's being encouraged to have a two-parent household, male and female, taking care of a child. That's what we need. Now, I do want to take a moment before we end to remind everybody to be reaching out once again to Kim Moser on House Bill 204. House Bill 204 deals with the um, certificate of need law. It deals with um, 
the competition competitors veto. So, you know, currently in law, if you want to expand out your healthcare operations, uh, add beds, purchase new equipment, go into a new area or market, you have to ask for permission from the government who turns around and asks your would-be competitors if you're allowed to open up and those competitors get to say no if they want to. So House Bill 204, which is currently in the Health Services Committee, won't be called, they're, they're refusing to call it forward, Kim Mosher the chair is, that would end that competitor's veto. But as I said, Kim Mosher won't call it forward. She's got a primary opponent, Karen Campbell. You can check her out at Campbell4KY.com. So this is a good opportunity to put some leverage on her to get her to call that bill forward or face the prospect of not being reelected because she's not representing the needs of of her constituents, but rather representing the needs of people like St. Elizabeth Hospital, who her husband works for. So you can reach out to leave a message for her at 1-800-372-7181. Once again, that's 1-800-372-7181. That's a legislative message hotline and ask to leave a message for Representative Mosier telling her to call House Bill 204 forward in committee. You can also email Kimberly Mosier at Kimberly, spell like normal, dot Mosier, M-O-S-E-R, at L-R-C dot K-Y dot gov. And you can email her. So if you're not a phone caller, you want to shoot her an email, shoot her an email. And while you're at it, every day she doesn't call it forward, you should be donating to her opponent, Karen Campbell, Campbell for K-Y dot com. Uh, we'll give you an update probably here later on in the week on how this push is going, but we need to be pushing this bill to be called forward for a vote. It's incredibly important right here in Kentucky. Well, y'all, that's what we have time for today. I was going to dig into also some of the bill filing deadlines, things that have been filed, but I ran out of time. So that means you got to tune back in tomorrow. You're listening to the Andrew Cooperator Show, your source for Kentucky politics. I'll see you back here tomorrow. Have a great rest of your day. <laughs>